Hi there, and welcome to another update on the geologic situation going on in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Friday, August 2nd. It is about 11.45 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 5.45 p.m. over in Iceland. And we have a few things to discuss today as we creep a little bit closer towards the next magma movement, whether that's in the subsurface with an intrusion or at the surface with an eruption. There's a few things going on. So firstly, I um, wanted to quickly point out that you can start watching the webcams if you haven't already. Uh, they've turned a few of these back on that were off over the last few weeks. So the mbl.ice webcams are up. This is a view from Hagafelt looking south towards Gudindavik. You can see that large fracture that crack that opened up along the south end of Hagafelt and you can see some of the gas coming out there. This does not necessarily mean that this is going to be the location of an eruption. This is just that, that we had uh, hot rock and or magma down in the subsurface during the last eruption that began at the end of May and so we're still seeing some of that steam and volcanic gases just creeping out of there. But this would be a good webcam to watch if we end up having an eruption that's a little bit further to the south of the system. This was one of our two scenarios. And then the other webcam, this is live from Iceland. This is looking to the northeast. There's our spatter cone from the May 29th eruption, uh, the new lava field here. And so this is looking in that direction. And so if we get an eruption that's a little bit further to the north uh, from town, this would be the view that might, or the webcam that might offer the best view of things to come. You can see just in the distance there too, uh, the cone from the 2021 Fagradalsfjall eruption as well. So let's go ahead and get to the new data that's come through. Uh, I'll go over the latest data and then there's a paper I want to review with you here at the end of the update. So we do have a new Met Office update from today, August 2nd. Uh, it's a brief update and it basically confirms kind of what I've been seeing in looking at the data the last few days as well. So you can see the title there, increased probability of magma flow and even an eruption in the coming days. Uh, number of earthquakes uh, in the area has slowly increased. I'll show you that with some of the seismic data here in a second. And according to their models, there's enough pressure, sufficient pressure in the system to trigger a new event in the coming days. So we don't know exactly how much pressure, how much volume of magma it's gonna take to break the rock and bring that magma towards the surface, but we're definitely within that window or we've met that threshold already. So will that be a sooner versus later thing? No one really knows for sure, uh, but it's something to keep an eye on in the days moving forward. Uh, so GPS measurements show that the uplift continues. Uh, all the indicators are that there could be magma migration and movement again in the subsurface or towards the surface uh, at any time in the next few days. Uh, if the sequence of events is similar to that of previous eruptions, the warning may be, may be very short. And so let's look at the earthquake data because that's what they talked about there the most. Let's start with the last 24 hours. Then I want to show you what the last weeks looked like and even go back a little further just for a little bit of a, a historical context. So here's the past 24 hours. And if you've been watching my updates over the last month or so, you can see this is you know, a bit of an uptick um, than what we normally see. Normally, when an eruption is either ongoing or has just ended, we might see in a 24-hour period anywhere from two to eight earthquakes. You can see uh, there's quite a few more here, there. So just a little cluster here, just northwest of Gudindavik, uh, a few around Hagafelt, and then another cluster up to the northwest where we had the vents open up for the last eruption and many of the other eruptions as well. Um, so these are the, the two scenarios, most likely locations for the next event to, event to open up during the next eruption, somewhere down in here or possibly down towards the town uh, and then one here. So it's impossible really to look at this earthquake distribution and know which one is the more likely situation right now. We would need to see a lot more clustering and a definitive, you know, one direction or one place versus another uh, showing a lot more seismic uh, noise and activity than the other. Right now, it's kind of evenly distributed across the board. So again, too early to say for sure um, right now. But again, something to keep an eye on moving forward. Let's look at the seismic data over the past. This is the past week. Again, um, 
recently, but I want to also give you some historical context here as well. So there's uh, some of those earthquakes down uh, just northwest of town. Here's the ones around Hagefeld, uh, and then the ones further north. So again, this is the past week. Let me get you a good, good scale there that'll show everything. Um, but just for context, I thought it'd be fun to go back in time and see what this area's seismic activity and frequency was at different points in time. So now that we know we're kind of on the precipice or very close to having an eruptive event, we can see here what sort of seismic activity level that gives us. Uh, if we go back a week, you'll see a lot fewer earthquakes. So this is, a, this is the same period, right? So these are showing six day periods. So you could see a, a week ago, the last week prior to this last week, um, fewer earthquakes, and then we'll just keep going back here. Fewer still going back two weeks, three weeks, so very few earthquakes, four weeks, and then eventually as we go through this lull in earthquake activity, so now we're looking at June 17th to June 23rd, uh, but eventually we'll get back, look there's only one there, that's pretty crazy, so from June 10th to June 16th, now this was while the eruption uh, was ongoing, the May 29th eruption, but eventually we'll get to Probably with this next click, there's June 3rd to June 9th. Again, two earthquakes in uh, this area. There we go. Eventually, we're going to get to where, what the earthquakes looked like that ushered in the last eruption on May 29th. So you can see this is sort of what we're looking for here. Before we get to this next event, this might be the pattern of earthquakes or something similar that we might see moving forward. Notice there's some sizable quakes in here, 2.8. Uh, there's a 2. It's hard to pick out the, the biggest circles in here. What's that one there? Is that the 2.8? Yeah, that's the 2.8. A um, little bit bigger one here, 2.3. So mainly under 3 in terms of magnitude, but you can, it does give you a feel better feel for the, the size and frequency of the quakes leading up to that May 29th eruption. Um, and, you know, we can go back further. So this is what it looked like, you know, a week prior or so this goes up to May 26 so leading up to that event and you could argue that that looks pretty similar to what we just saw in terms of just total numbers not locations per se uh, to what we saw for this week's earthquake uh, distribution so just just a fun comparison here uh, nothing definitive just something fun to look at May 13th to 19th uh, and then we start working our way back in time and earthquakes getting fewer and fewer in between these eruptive events so uh, and then we could probably work this back to, let's see, March 16th would be the last one. So here's March 25th to 31st, March 18th to 24th. So this is after the eruption had begun. And then I'm assuming on the next click, I'm going to see a lot of earthquakes. Yeah, there you go. So a little bit higher amount here for this March 11th to 17th um, cluster. So just something, again, comparatively to just give you an idea of what we might be looking for moving forward. Uh, for the GPS data, um, pretty similar trend to what we've been seeing. Uh, the, the uplift and inflationary trends as recorded by the GPS instruments seems to be pretty much on par with what we've seen over the last week or two. No real noticeable deviation in terms of the, um, the, the trend or the, the slope of those, those tracks there. Here's the Svart Sengi one that we've been looking at. Uh, so it seems like everything's still trending upwards. Might be like inflating a little bit less so, but it's a little hard to tell uh, based on the data there. So inflation continues, uplift continues, and we would expect that to continue. We could also look at using our fun new uh, website here. We could also go in and look at it this way. So here is here is the uplift for the Svart Sengi station. Here's the May 29th eruption. Here we are going through June. And you can see there's a few little lulls in here and you could argue that the last three data points there are, are kind of flatlining, but we need to see more uh, data points to see what the real trend is there. So, so as far as we know, inflation seems to continue. Uh, this also bears out when we look at the latest um, INSAR data. So this is ground deformation data obtained by satellites passing over. Let's see, which one do we want here? Um, so this one goes up through July 30th. So this is a couple days old. So they passed over the area on July 14th, made another pass on July 30th, um, and was able to measure each one of these bands of color 
corresponds to an, uh, an uplift increment. I'm not sure what the uplift amount is on this data, um, but you can see definitive uplift more or less centered uh, right near the Blue Lagoon and Blue Lagoon's right here and the power plant area which sits about here. So pretty close to that area there. Um, so everything's trending towards some sort of event. Of course I'll keep you posted here. And then the last thing I want to do here as we've run through all the data is um, take a quick look at a paper that I read recently uh, that I thought was kind of interesting. It doesn't have any huge implications for the, the possible eruption that we're looking at or anything like that, but it is fundamentally tied to the volcanism that Iceland experiences. And this is a paper written by uh, Nicholas Selly um, from Ireland and then some of his co-authors here. And this was in Earth and Planetary Science Letters, The Tilted Iceland Plume and Its Effect on the North Atlantic Evolution and Magnetism. So when we think about hot spots or mantle plumes, we often think about them, because it makes the most sense this way, as being these sort of vertical conduits that carry that hot rock up towards the surface, whereby some of it turns into magma melts, and then that is what fuels our uh, volcanic activity. Um, but this paper actually came to using some of the methods they used here, they were able to come to the conclusion and the interpretation that the plume underneath Iceland is actually tilted. I want to show you that here in a second. So what they did here without getting into all the details, and I'm by no means a geophysicist, so I got lost in reading some of their, their methods for seismic tomography, but basically what they can do is they used a huge set of data, I think it was like 27,000 um, different seismic events, so places, so earthquakes, if you will, and recorded at over 6,000 stations. And they look specifically at the S waves. So when we have an earthquake, we generate uh, several different types of waves that radiate out during an earthquake. There's the P waves, which travel fast. Those are compressional push-pull waves, like a like a spring, if you will. And then there's the S waves, which have more of an up-down component of motion. And the S waves are interesting because they don't propagate through uh, liquids. And by looking at the S waves, and more specifically the velocity of the S waves. So if the S waves moving quickly through rock, that rock would tend to be very uh, competent and brittle, um, maybe very, um, come on light, there we go, sorry. <laughs> Um, so those S waves would move very quickly through rock that's very maybe brittle or dense. But when S waves move through hot rock, they tend to move through at lower velocity. So by looking at these low velocity zones in the rock, you can infer where the rock is hotter and that would seem to indicate where the, the mantle plume is. Um, so let me take you to one of the, so here's uh, maybe the first important graphic here. So this is a series of maps that show the the hot rock or the low velocity uh, S wave zone will be show up in these oranges and reds and into the blacks. Uh, the higher velocity, more dense, kind of competent and colder rock will be these blues, purples, and pinks. So you can see the plate boundary here shown with the green line. There's Iceland right there. And maybe just for kicks, we'll, we'll zoom in on these a little bit closer. That's a little better. So you can see Greenland, Iceland, North America, Europe over here. Um, and at 20 kilometers depth, so at 20 kilometers down into the crust, here is the S wave velocities. In case you can see, interpret these orange areas as slightly hotter areas. So you can see by the time you get to 36 and 56 and 80 kilometers depth, boy, that hot spot really pops up pops out being right along the plate boundary, especially at 80 kilometers, you can really see that the, um, the heat flow along the plate boundary is much greater than away from it, which is what we would expect, right? But here's where it gets interesting. As you go deeper, so at 110 looks pretty similar, 150, hot, cold on the sides, 200, 260, Okay, still kind of showing that, although it's starting to cool off a little bit at 260. But by the time you get way down there, so now we're down 330 kilometers down into the planet. It's amazing they're able to get this kind of data from this depth in the Earth, but it's pretty awesome. Now you can see that the location of the hotter rock, the, the low velocity S waves, has shifted off of Iceland and is moving over here towards Greenland. But, and you can really see it probably best on this 410 
kilometer depth one here where the hotter rock seems to be over here in the eastern part of Greenland and Iceland at that depth is you know more or less normal in terms of its um, heat flow or if we or, or s wave velocity if we want to use that which is the really the strict data there um, so what this means is is then if it was a vertical if it was a vertical mantle plume under Iceland we would expect to see this pattern here like we see at 80 kilometers we would see that pattern all the way down into these deeper zones but you can see that the low velocity zone shifts over into eastern Greenland which suggests that the plume uh, is a little bit tilted. Here's another kind of run through. They just picked four of those maps to kind of show you the progression. So 56 kilometers, everything's pretty much along the plate boundary. Uh, 150 kilometers, mostly there as well. Um, but by the time you get down to 330 and then 485 kilometers, that zone of low velocity, S-wave low velocity shifts over into Greenland. And then that sort of culminates here with, uh, I guess, this figure here, uh, which is a 3D um, model or plot, I suppose, of the mantle plume. So you can see it coming up. So here's Greenland here, uh, and here's Iceland over here. But you can actually see the, the plume migrate and deflect to the east until it comes right up underneath Iceland. Uh, and so I thought this was pretty interesting. And so, um, you know, kind of challenging our... Are, are at least my basic conceptions about these mantle plumes just being like you know smoke from a chimney just rising more or less vertically that actually there's a lot more complexity to them and the fact that they're able to you know um, get some of these details out using these uh, the seismic data is pretty amazing so I just wanted to share that with you there I'll make sure I put this paper uh, and a link to it underneath the description for the video. So hopefully that was helpful. We'll keep our eyes uh, on the Reykjanes Peninsula around Grindavik and see what goes on over the next few days. Um, I will chime in as best I can with another update as soon as something uh, notable happens. But thank you for your support of the channel. Thanks for watching and take care.